Welcome to Start Here, Go Everywhere. I am Linda Moyo, an alumna of Jobs for America's graduates. On this podcast, we bring you incredible guests from all walks of life, offering the skills to educate, inspire, and challenge you to succeed in both school, on the job skills, and in personal life, leading to productive and rewarding careers. Our Women's History Month feature this week is Janelle DeRay. She serves as JAG's Chief Operating Officer and Executive Vice President. This podcast explores the significance of her upbringing, turning her passions into purpose and change, and most importantly, being a woman in the midst of it all. So Janelle, one of the first interactions that I've had with you was when you were interviewing me to get an internship position with JAG National. And you asked me a question at the end of the interview. You said, do you think that, pe- uh, do you think that pineapples belong on pizza? And I said, no. But I'm curious, can you go a little bit deeper on that? Was that like a trick psychological uh, question? Or, you know, what was that? It was not a trick. I promise you that. Um, it's, you know, I'm a, then I've gotten this feedback from my team members over the years, but I'm a very driven, headstrong, I think serious person, but I also like to have fun. And if I don't remind myself of those fun moments and express that to team members, and in this case, clearly I thought you killed the interview or nailed the interview. So they asked it, but um, you know, we got to make sure that we have fun. So I promise you it was not a trick. It was more of let's, okay, we got through that part. Let's talk as humans and let's, let's make sure that we can smile and joke around. And uh, unless you really hate pineapples, then it probably would have been not the best question, but. <laughs> no, I really thought about that question afterwards. Cause I was like, You know, the way individuals answer questions determines so much about their personality, how they interact with people. So I thought it was one of those questions and I just never asked you uh, as a follow up question. So I'm glad that I got the opportunity to do that here. Yeah, I I don't even remember that, probably because it wasn't about the question. It was more of just (laughs) who's Linda? Let's get to know her. Yeah. Well, that's good, because today the tables have turned, Janelle, and (laughs) I would like to get to know more about you. You are a fascinating woman uh, woman who is uh, headstrong from what I have been able to gather, and you like to get things done, and when you do that, you do them well. So I want to dig in and kind of ask you, the person who you are today, did you see that for yourself as... Uh, a middle schooler, a high schooler? Did you see yourself working, you know, with Jag National with such a high position? Well, I didn't know Jag existed, so not specific to Jag, but, you know, I think I always knew that I wanted to have a positive impact on the world in some way, shape, or form. I didn't Mm -hmm. quite know how. I also knew that I grew up in a very, very rural community. So Mm. um, my town is called Viking, Minnesota. It's about 80 people in the northwest corner of Minnesota. I grew up on a farm 10 miles outside of Viking. Um, Mm -hmm. My my high school graduating class was 27 kids. Whoa. There's no stoplight. Yeah, I know. I said (laughs) rural, rural. Um, There's no stoplight in the county I grew up in, in Marshall County. And I really appreciated where I grew up. You know, it's kind of all hands on deck. Family has to support each other. Mm -hmm. You know, lots of those farm chores. Um, We didn't have animals, but Mm. lots of harvesting. So wheat, corn, barley, sunflowers, the whole bit. Um, Yeah. You know, work ethic was installed in me at a very young age. But so I appreciated all that. And I think that has formulated a lot of, of my growing up and my personality now and my headstrongness, I guess you could say. But we were lacking diverse perspectives in that Mm. community because it was so rural. So I always had a very strong desire and hunger to meet people who had different experiences than me from different parts of the world than me. So I always had 
this hunger to to leave essentially um and i made that very clear at a young age that i want to see the world i want to meet people with different backgrounds that look different from me i want to learn i want to learn i want to learn um mm-hmm. so that got me focused on um you know the way to leave is college in a small community like that going to college and leaving um which my sister was the first in our family to go to college she went to the twin cities about a 6 hour drive away and you know i followed suit but that desire has always been in me to to learn mm-hmm. from others and then take those learnings to help others um when i was through age 5 to well all through my high school career i was very uh i played piano and i was dead focused on piano 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 music 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 mm. so i yeah. started playing professionally around 16 and my mom would drive me two hours to lessons to a university in Bemidji, Minnesota, so I could study at the at the university because I kind of graduated from my teachers in the local community. And then fast forward to when I was 16, and it was the 2000 elections with the hanging chad. You may have heard about it. You're too young to remember, I think, the, I'm too the young. school election. Yeah, but <laughs> I just remember... I got really into politics at that moment because it it seemed Mm -hmm. insane to me that the entire nation, you know, there are those who voted, voted. I couldn't vote at that time, obviously. And it was this push and pull and tug of war and fight about who won the election. Yeah. Um, You know, with the Bush or Gore. And that, I just became enthralled with that discussion and got interested in politics at that time because I think it was, because it was on in our house all the time. And I think that is what tapped into my interest of having a platform to help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So I started getting interested in politics and policy. And then um, when I was, you know, 10th, 11th, 12th grade in high school, started digging deeper into that in ethics classes and social studies. And I remember having conversations with our principal about um, campaign finance reform, which was big at the time, a big discussion, and started formulating my my opinions in, in that arena. And mm-hmm. one of my teachers nominated me for a National Youth Leadership Conference. Um, wow. So I think, yeah, so that was really cool. I went to D.C. Um, when I was 18. I think there was about eight kids from Minnesota, but kids from all over the country, which... Mm-hmm. Number one, I was in D.C. Number two, I was meeting kids from all over the country that had different experiences, looked different from me, bring different perspectives. So I fell in love with it. I'm an outgoing introvert, but when I'm put in a position, I will force myself to tap into the outgoing piece, even though I'm an introvert. And and I fell in love with the city. And I went home and I told my parents, I will live in D.C. for at least one year of my life. I loved it. I love the feeling, the vibrancy, the... The, the power, because to me, mm. power, if you had power, you could make that positive change. Um, so, uh, you know, it was pretty much written in stone, at least at that point, that policy was of high interest to me. Um, and, you know, my ideas and my motivations have changed since then. I've lived in D.C. now for 12 years. Um, grad school brought me out here and I got my master's in public administration with an emphasis on uh, nonprofit management, and all of those pieces kind of came together perfectly in my current role. But I have changed my mind about my interest in at least politics because for a while at that age, I was thinking maybe I'd run for a political office, which ah. I think I've been cured of that disease. I've been cured of that disease. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say that? I'm curious. Well, you know, when I was in grad school is when the Affordable Care Act passed. And this is when we started seeing a lot of gridlock in Congress after that was passed. Um, After the midterms happened, after Obama's first election, you saw the Republicans came in and Republicans and Democrats alike say that was a transitional point in terms of gridlock. You had Republicans, long-term Republicans leaving office, um, saying they feel like they can't get things done. Senator Olympia Mm -hmm. Snow is the perfect example. She didn't run again because she had hit that sad moment where she said, Mm -hmm. I feel that I can do more good for my country outside of the office. Wow. Um, clearly on the Democratic side, you heard the, 
the comments about gridlock and not being able to get nominations through for Obama's cabinet. And then you, and now Janelle speaking, it feels like we're still in that moment going back and forth and we're, we're a divided nation right now. Um, I think we all know that and it's something we need to work on. Um, but throughout all that, I had an opportunity to, to work with JAG, Jobs for America's graduates. Mm -hmm. And that to me, uh, you know, we get to work with both Democrats and Republicans and you can talk to our young people who are in the program. You can meet our mm -hmm. specialists who have committed their lives to supporting young oh, people. Yeah. Our affiliate leaders and our national staff. I mean, everyone is so committed and mm -hmm. you are seeing the positive impact every day. And that's where, it, I, you know, I realized I think I can get more good done at a massive scale, which to me, I was always, how can I leverage myself to have broad impact, mm -hmm. um, systemic impact, um, with a, by, you know, by working up the chain and having a seat at the table. Um, and that is, that is what I, I feel proud about with JAG and I didn't know JAG existed, but I think my motivations, um, and my, my goals and my desires and my hopes for what I could do, um, were, were realized in JAG, or at least when I was introduced to JAG, I said, I, I felt home. Yeah. So you mentioned that you finally have a seat at the table. Tell me more about how you got started with JAG exactly and what, what you do, what your role is, what a day-to-day -day looks like for you. Okay. Okay. Well, I actually got involved with JAG working with our president and CEO, Ken Smith, um, in some other areas, not related to JAG, but around workforce development, policy, education. But I always knew that he was the president and founder of JAG. So mm -hmm. kind of had this, this distant awareness and appreciation of the organization. Um, and I started working with Ken full time after I finished grad school in 2010. Okay. Um, and, you know, I had done a few stints before that with the Association of American Law Schools. I worked with the governor's office in Minnesota for a, a stint as an intern in my undergrad uh, program. But there was a moment where there was a an opening. Uh, someone with JAG had left, taken a new opportunity, and it was ahead of a policy event, our, our national thought leader event. And mm -hmm. Ken asked me that if I could help because the event was only about a month away. So this brings together members of the presidential administration, members of the cabinet, um, members of Congress, governors, community leaders, educational leaders across the country. And it's a very intimate group of about 100 leaders mm -hmm. coming together to say, how do we build policies and programs to support young people so they are prepared to enter the workforce and have a real opportunity, a real shot? So I really like the discussion. Um, but that was that seat at the table moment, which clearly mm. no one was listening to me, but I was still in the room, right? Yeah. So I could learn, observe, and realize that this, this organization really um, can bring together some of these key leaders, these key stakeholders that by coming together can make a positive difference. So I was really attracted to that. And after the event, mm -hmm. um, I told Ken, I, I really love this work. I'd love to stay involved with JEG. Then you fast forward about three months later, and it was the National Student Leadership Academy, which you know oh, yeah. when, when people come to D.C. Um, you went, right, Linda? Oh, best experience, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, you, and it reminded me of me when I did the National Youth Leadership Conference when yeah. you know I came to D.C., and I remember being shocked that people would put napkins on my lap, you know, yes. or... Frankly, even using a knife, you know, I just yeah. cut my meat with a fork. I didn't need a knife. And I saw that my lived experience through all these young people coming together and then getting to know them, hearing our story, hearing their stories, also meeting the specialists, meeting our affiliate mm -hmm. leaders, which is where I spent most of my time in the, in the council of state affiliate business meetings. And it was, you know, five days of drinking from a fire hose from the board meeting to the luncheon with all the young people, they go into the National Student Leadership Academy and getting engagements with them in the hallway and hearing their excitement. First time being in a hotel, which again, brought back a lot of memories for me. And um, and at the end of that, we were checking, you know, the national team was checking out of the hotel Saturday and I went up to Ken and I said, this 
this individual who had left, I was like, that, you know, I'm, I'm happy for her that she got a new job, but I am so excited for myself because I am in love with this organization and I don't ever want to go anywhere else. And, you know, it was really the combination. It was, it was that, that event and just seeing the whole impact of the organization over a period of five days Mm -hmm. and, and then all these things that have been burning in my heart and connections in my mind over the years, just all synced up because it was, you know, at the national level, supporting efforts that can tremendously impact people at a massive scale. And, um, you know, and also like my grad school experience, nonprofit management, bringing policy together, um, and leveraging public funds in a way that they're meant to be used, which is to help the people who need it most and give everyone a fair chance so we can all be better together. Um, so that was, I have to, it was just a love fest for myself, I have to say, because it was um, a wonderful experience. And I've been passionate about JAG and doing different roles and has been fortunate to um with the organization now for gosh 10 years and move from affiliate services to partnerships to fundraising to uh government affairs and working with our members Mm. of the board um and now as coo and executive vice president i have the wonderful opportunity to work with a group of individuals who are just as passionate and committed Mm. as myself but have varying um varying er areas of expertise, different opinions. Um, and I just, it's really magical to bring this team together and Mm -hmm. reflect on the success of our young people over the last 40 years and then position the organization for the next 40 years. And what does it mean to innovate, innovate JAG, innovate services for our students and, and also put them at the center and listen more to them. So I'm really excited to be a COO because it's giving me an opportunity to help shape that for the future, working in partnership with our team and our network and our young people, including you. Well, <laughs> well I love getting any chance to, you know, work with JAG and especially uh, the individuals who work for JAG. And, you know, when you see their passion come through, that just feeds your passion to do whatever it is that you're passionate about. And you brought up the point that you're the COO and EVP. That is huge. And by the time everyone sees this, it will be Women's History Month. And earlier on, you mentioned that when you first tapped into uh, working with JAG, you were, you know, you they were giving you a seat at the table. However, you did mention that not they didn't not that they didn't listen to you, but at that point, uh, your voice wasn't heard. Is this an experience uh, as a woman uh, in higher up positions that you have experienced, or if not, what has been that experience for you? It's a great question. You know, I've been in gosh hundreds, if not thousands of meetings over the last 12 years. <laughs> and many of them, I've been fortunate to have a seat at the table. And it's it's a question, it's a good question that I can also, I think it's a two-way street. Mm-hmm. Clearly, in some of those instances, people did not take the time to ask what I thought. You know, whether yeah. it's my age, my gender, my disposition, who knows. But yeah. there were clearly the, those times. And you can, you can read that in a room. You can go in and see who doesn't take you seriously. And it's mm. really also a factor of age, um, I would say, especially in this town. Mm. Um, I would also say, though, that, you know, my personal upbringing, the culture, I mean, I'm Scandinavian by nature. Okay. <laughs> and Scandinavians are not known for being warm and fuzzy in terms of their culture. <laughs> um, we're pretty independent and you know, maybe living in those cold communities makes us a little cold as well. But <laughs> I think I could have, um, I think I could have leaned into it more as well. I could have spoken up more. I tend to be an observer mm. and listen and watch before jumping the gun and speaking my opinion up front. I like to know what other people think around me, which I think is a good quality in some cases, in many cases, yeah. in terms of the team. But when you are at those tables, mm-hmm. 
And you have a lot of people with a lot of experience and a lot of opinions because of those experiences and they're eager to share to help. Oh yeah. It is important that you jump in and not only listen because you won't get a chance. You won't get a chance. So it is important to come prepared and be ready with your opinion um, or your idea or just, or, you know, just saying something. So mm. your voice is heard. Your voice is heard. Yeah. Say something. But so your voice is heard. So I think it's a two way street. There are definitely those times where, you know, the, the support wasn't there. Um, in certain, you know, in just in some meetings, you can read it on someone's face. But there are those times where I probably could have spoken up sooner. Mm. And um, I guess that would go back to giving advice to women entering the profession is don't always wait for someone to give you that moment. They might not. So come prepared, come ready for the meeting, do your research beforehand, because if you are going to speak up, which you should, it needs to be relevant. It needs to be on topic um, because, you know, people are quick to judge younger folks. And if mm -hmm. you bring something up and it's not relevant or on topic, it, that might further the judgment. Hmm. So how have you personally dealt with that judgment uh, so that we can help you? You know, you just gave them great advice, you know, that you have to be prepared. You have to show up and almost push yourself out of your comfort zone and speak your truth and speak your voice, but say it with pride as well so that your voice yeah. is truly heard. But how do you deal with that, um, with that pressure? You know, this is more simplistic than it, than I should make it. But I, I have this idea that if it's part of the job, it's part of the job. So there's not mm -hmm. really an excuse. And it's a, it's a frame of reference that has worked for me. It may mm -hmm. not work for everyone, but if this is part of the job, you just got to figure out how to get it done. So that means preparation, reading materials, resources, you know, the internet is there for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I shouldn't say for everyone, as long as you have connectivity, which is something the nation needs to be working on. And we are, um, but you know, you have to come prepared and that is how you, that is how it, the, in those moments where you got to get out of your comfort zone and speak your truth, and make sure it's relevant to the topic or the goal, not necessarily to everyone around the table, if you're trying to change mm -hmm. things, right? But making sure it's relevant to your goal, preparation is key. So take the time to, if you're going to a meeting, read yeah. all the bios of everyone in that meeting, get to know their mm -hmm. background. What makes, you know, do they serve on any boards? What does their resume look like? That'll give you an inclination of what makes them passionate, what makes them um, excited, where their expertise lies. And if you go into a meeting, understanding the goals of that meeting, the people who are in the room, then prepare, prepare your talking points, prepare, prepare your personal goals for the end of that meeting by recognizing who's in the room and what likely would resonate more with them, whether it's yeah. what you say or how you say it. Yeah. You brought up something earlier on that you are, you tend to be independent and I don't know if everybody has this realization, but for me, it was huge. Even though it's simple, it's not easy. And it is the realization that teamwork is essential, you know, in work, family. Like, it's something that you use every single day. And I didn't see the impact of it while going through school. And I'm a senior in college right now, and I'm finally seeing how, you know, doing that group project with five people who have different schedules and different opinions and different personalities, how vital that is. So can you share a little bit about how you have maneuvered that with your independence? That's an excellent question. And I, I was like, you, I, when we had team assignments in college, I was like, Oh, come on, can I just do it? Um, but you, you cannot go as far alone. It just, it's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, what has helped me, well, RT is eventually, there's only so much you can do, right? So I had to do it the yeah. hard way by recognizing I'm, I can't do anymore. I'm at my capacity. Yeah. So it first started out like that. But then when you start working with other people, you recognize that they have a different perspective, a different talent. Um, 
that they can bring to the table, which is a little ironic considering my hunger for meeting different people my entire life yeah. and different perspectives my entire life, but yet still feeling more comfortable operating on my own. So I wanted everyone's mm -hmm. input and perspectives and I wanted to observe that, but it, it took me a long time to, I think, be comfortable enough with myself to break out of that and say, okay, let's all do it together now collectively. So I would say capacity forced me <laughs> to finally think through how we work together as teams. And I've always loved working with the JAG team and colleagues because everyone is so passionate, but it takes a lot of intentionality to figure out how you mm. work well together and yeah. how to create the space to, to, to hear different perspectives, different ideas. You have to intentionally ask because if you don't ask people probably, they may not answer and you are missing out on a lot of talent and great ideas and perspectives. So I've been doing a lot of um, preparation for this role and research and talking to people outside of the organization for their perspectives on how have you approached um, working with new teams, structuring new teams. We have amazing people who have helped us along the way um, mm -hmm. to do so. Uh, but it's if you don't take the time to not only create that space for your team and create the opportunity for input, guidance, perspectives, or just even sharing, getting to know each other as humans to build that trust, mm -hmm. Uh, you're going to be missing out a lot on a lot and whatever you're doing, whether it's a school project or, you know, leading an organization, it's, it's going to be hard to be successful. Our, our world is moving really fast oh, yeah. and in order to keep up and be competitive and, and it's important to be competitive in whatever you do, a uh, good, comp good competitive, obviously um, you have to be agile and you have to be, willing to adapt because the world is changing nonstop and you cannot do that without a team. You cannot mm. do that without listening to a team. You cannot do that without empowering your team so they can carry the water alongside with you. Um, so I would say necessity forced me to recognize and implement what I've always naturally been hungry for, but maybe mm -hmm. a little bit uncomfortable about. And and then seeing the fruits of that labor and how our team is growing and how our team is stepping up to challenges that this organization has never faced. Mm. I mean, COVID was an unprecedented challenge for all nonprofits in our space, all young people across the country. Mm -hmm. um, you can't get that done without agile teamwork and without building trust and without supporting each other and without listening to each other on what is the best way to do this based on your experience? Because we've never done it before. So yeah, we need, we need insights. So Janelle, tell me about how you are able to balance, uh, you know, working for this incredible organization, but yet keep saying, because, you know, there is a lot of work <laughs> to be done. But however, if, you know, you are always constantly working, you won't be there for the work to be, you know, to get done. So tell me about how you take care of yourself outside of leading JAG. You know, it's, and it's especially hard now with COVID, right? Because everyone, oh, yeah. no matter what their job is, their job is about to, I, there, there are two types of workers, I think, in this country, those whose work exponentially increased and those who are laid off. And, mm -hmm. um, so it's been incredibly stressful for everyone, especially those who have lost their income and, and been laid off, which we saw a lot of that impact in the young people we serve, which is why our team is busting butts in order to help and figure out new solutions. But so it, it's been hard throughout COVID because everyone's stuck in their homes. But for me personally, mm -hmm. you know, trying to get trying to maintain that routine in a mm -hmm. way that is um, not monotonous in terms of you know, it's very easy to just work all the time when there's not a lot of places to go, although we are, you know, safely opening up in some ways now. Um, exercise. If you don't get some sort of physical activity, it it's very easy to just sit at your computer and work all day and be on the phone all day or on Zooms all day. So making sure that there's physical activity to break things up and fuel your your body and your mind. Um, I I love to read. I love external information, um, both 
work related, but importantly, recreational. And mm -hmm. I do love to, uh, to travel, which I'm hoping to Ooh. start doing again. More. Uh, it's travel has always been on my priority list since I was a little girl, because my mm -hmm. corner of the world was so small. So it was always ingrained in me that I will travel as much as possible, as often as possible. And, you know, that I think brings a refreshing lens to not just life in general and meeting new mm -hmm. people and seeing new places and getting new perspectives, but it also, I think, indirectly benefits our organization by having people on our team who can bring those experiences and just be, be refreshed from a little bit of time off. Um, yeah. So, but I, I'm, it's something I'm still working on, Linda, because... Oh yeah, it's it's incredibly hard to force that time, um, as we continue dealing with the with the results of the pandemic and working through long term impacts of it. For sure, and I appreciate you opening up and saying, you know, having that routine of how you stay sane and take care of your taking care of yourself is a progress. Uh, and it's never going to stop whether you are 18 years old, 40, 60, 80. It's something that's always in progress. So I appreciate you uh, mentioning that. And I am interested. You said that you love traveling. What has been a place that you've traveled to that has impacted you the most? And what is one thing that you've learned from traveling that you see yourself using day to day? You know, um, there's a lot of different places, but I would say I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple. So most recently I was in Romania. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my longtime partner is from there. So we went and saw his family and I had never been. So we were there for a, a significant amount of time over the holidays. So um, being, in a, being in a former Eastern Bloc country and still mm -hmm. seeing the the history of it in terms of some of the old buildings from the 50s and 60s that were built by the communists and hearing the background story of moving entire populations against their will into these yeah. homes to the cities for work um, and then seeing the difference between buildings that have gone up since the fall of the Iron Curtain that was impactful and then of course um we were in Timisoara, so that is where uh, a big revolution happens um, 30 some years ago, I think in 88 or 89, with the fall of the dictator there, Ceausescu, and the, mm. the resilience of the people and how it was a people led revolution. Um, and, the, and hearing firsthand from some of my partner's friends who were, you know, teenagers when it all happened, and there was mm. a lot of violence and some bloodshed in that community. That was very impactful. And um, the other one I would say, I went to Vietnam with a couple of girlfriends a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And we had traveled through the Mekong Delta. And on the way back to the where the whole tour started, we were on a horse and carriage and went through um, some communities of, you know, just abject poverty and saw some you know, people in the community who had significant defects because of Agent Orange and the weapons used during that war. You yeah. know, and this is decades ago and seeing that continued impact, mm -hmm. um, it was a, a stark reminder of, you know, we need to work together, come together. And especially now as where the nation wakes up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, just, you know, these are lives and these are people and we need to, we just need to keep working at it, Linda. We need to support each other. We need to get to know and understand different cultures and we need to respect yeah. differences um, because, you know, from Romania and Vietnam, both similar takeaways and war, mm. war is no good. And people, and it's average people like you and me um, and our families who, who suffer as a result of it. And it doesn't mm. matter if it's happening, you know, in our backyard or if it's happening across the globe, it's, it's the impact on, on humans. And 
and not to like bring it down at the end of this, but <laughs> you asked what was the most impactful and those two really stick out. They're, they're good reminders. And the people are beautiful, you know, mm. the, you know, the people that I've met overseas are, are beautiful, wonderful people, despite the challenges and horror that their communities have faced over decades. What makes, or I guess, how did you figure out or discover your passion and how have you then used that to drive your purpose in life? You know, I do not like not having a say. Um, mm. You know, part of, you know, I talked about the election and it drove me nuts, you know, not having a chance to vote in that election. I was 16, you know, so it's the rule, but it's mm -hmm. that I think a lot of my passion came out of that and understanding politics and thinking that, you know, there's a group of people that make up the laws of this country mm -hmm. and, you know, they're, they're doing their best by and large, but they impact our daily lives. So I really felt powerless by not at least aspiring to have that seat at the table, whether it was at that time thinking running for office one day or now just being able to support policy that will have a positive impact on more lives. So I think my passion is not, not, I want to have power for good mm. access to access to support working with others to make positive change. Um, there was a time where I was going to go to the Peace Corps and was getting my shots and getting ready to my, for my country to, I was going to, you know, get my assignment mm -hmm. and a couple things happened in my, in my personal life with my, my grandmother getting sick, mm. um, my sister getting pregnant. And there were just some monumental life moments that I yeah. did not want to miss out um, in case my grandma passed away and, you know, also the birth of my first niece or nephew. Mm -hmm. And I also had this moment of, you know, maybe I can then go to DC and start working on something broader. Cause mm -hmm. if I were going to go to a place and help a community, that's absolutely wonderful. But I always had this hunger of how can I, how can I move fast enough to help as many people as broadly as possible, as quickly as possible in my time on this planet. So I would say my passion comes from, you know, a personal interest in having a seat at the table in order to make mm. positive impact and then driving that positive impact as quickly as possible because we're only here for a limited amount of time. I love that answer. If okay. students... Um, <laughs> Put me on the <laughs> Is there any like, you know, individual individuals wanting to get into the kind of work that you do, Janelle? How can they get a seat at the table just like you have? Um, I would say, you know, for me it was a lot of uh, I, I worked really, really hard in school because I didn't, you know, I didn't have the access to my mom was on the school board, my dad was on um our our township. Uh, council, which township is, you know, very small area in rural Minnesota, you know, so they were always civically engaged and made it clear voting is important and all of those pieces, but there wasn't a lot of, you know, a, a lot of ladders to climb there, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, for me, the ticket was education. So study, go to college, learn as much as possible. And I always wanted to go to grad school, but the ticket was education for me. But I wish in that mm. process, I would have done more outreach, like I was saying earlier, get to know people, not mm. just to get to know them, but also forming those, those networks at a young age so you can climb together and you can advance Ooh. together. So the Ooh. sooner you can get your mindset into community engagement, Mm -hmm. um, identifying something in your community you want to see a positive change in, uh, then, you know, go to city council meetings, go to public mm -hmm. hearings, and then don't do so alone, but go with, 
people that share your values and your beliefs and and just start talking to people and sharing them and you'll you'll get a response and you'll start hearing from others who are in those positions mm-hmm. how they respond to you or don't and that will give you the feedback you need to either adjust your plan or adjust your approach not losing sight on what your original goal is yeah but you have to develop a pathway that navigates whatever systems may be in place and sometimes you might want to change the systems but in order to change them you got to navigate the current ones to get in which oftentimes puts the burden on on those whose systems most negatively impacts and that's Mm. that's that's something that we have to continuously work towards especially for our communities of color for women Mm -hmm. um you know, the burden of advancing is on the person who wants to see the change. Uh, not often is it the people who are in power that will make that change on behalf of those who are burdened. So that's yeah. another piece too is find those allies, identify your goal, mm-hmm. map out the scenario, and then productively keep working towards that that ultimate goal and be willing to adjust courses needed in order to get there. So I, in a way, believe that it's sometimes who you know is better than what you know. Do you believe the same? And if so, why? And if not, why is that? You know, Linda, I want to say you're wrong, but it's, mm-hmm. it's both. It is it is who you know, and it, but I would say that's, that shouldn't be enough. And sometimes mm. it is. Yeah. But if we as a society are going to move forward, it's, it cannot be just who you know. It has to who be you know. what you know and who you know. Mm-hmm. But I would, yeah, I, I would say, but build those networks, like I was saying, mm-hmm. because who you know, the who might be in your community and your peer. They might not be the who yet, but they might be yeah. the future who. So. So build your who's around you and then go find the who's that are the who's right now and start building bridges. So yeah. that, so you can do <laughs> I will never, we've all been in those meetings where the who doesn't know the what. Ooh. And that to me is very transparent. Whoa. So I, and those, you gotta, you gotta have some substance. You gotta, you got to either know of what you speak or be willing to, to learn and wow. adapt. So that's Can my Can you say that it. again? The first part of that was so powerful. Oh, the, we've all been in meetings where uh-huh. the who at the table doesn't know the what, meaning, Ooh. meaning that, um, well, that brings it back to the importance of hearing input from around the table. Mm-hmm. Because wow. the what is probably around that table, but you got to be willing to to ask questions and listen. Hmm. Well, Janelle, this has been extremely enlightening to hear a little bit about your story. But before we finish off this podcast, I want to ask you three questions. And when you answer these, answer them in a sentence or maybe in a few sentences. Not, you know, not okay. too long. The first question okay. is, if you could have dinner with any two individuals, who would they be and why? Okay. Um, Barack Obama and, and uh, George W. Bush. Why is that? You know, they're back-to-back presidents in the history, even in the short time, especially since Bush, you've seen it rewritten um his story a bit and you know bush i remember at the end of his presidency he had such a low approval rating Hmm. and as a young woman i was curious how he went into the room knowing how low his approval rating was and how he continued on you know um and since his presidency just watching him and how he is stood up for bipartisanship, mm-hmm. um, stood up for what he thinks is right, regardless of you know however people judge his presidency. I 
he's always struck me as someone who would be a fun guy to have a beer with. I know you said dinner, but <laughs> maybe dinner and a beer. And then Barack Obama as president, you know, just inspired such hope across the country and, you know, just shot up so quickly based mm -hmm. on continued perseverance and commitment to public service and what he thought was the right thing to do on behalf of all people across the country. Um, and clearly there's a lot of, a lot of um, people who aren't fans of his either. Mm -hmm. But I think after both of those presidencies, seeing how they have come together in different avenues. Yeah. Uh, has, I mean, I would love just all three of us could get together. If all three of us could have dinner together, that'd be great. And I would oh, love yeah. to hear them go back and forth about their differences and their obviously philosophical difference in approaches, but I think a lot of similarities in terms of how the public have judged them. And I would love to just listen. Here I go into my traditional approach. I'd love to just listen <laughs> and observe. And then at the end of the conversation, come with some questions based on what they've shared. Janelle, what makes you feel hopeful, inspired, and happy right now? Young people. Young people. Um, when I talk to JAG students, mm -hmm. JAG graduates like yourself, and I feel like you, there's so much more clarity, um, at least than my generation, or maybe me personally at that age, uh, in knowing your the importance of your voice mm -hmm. and the collective power of your voice. So mm -hmm. young people are holding adults accountable in ways that mm -hmm. I think are incredibly impressive and important for our future. And talking to young people, um, not even just in America, but across the globe. I had the benefit mm -hmm. of talking to a couple of freshman students in Heidelberg, Germany recently, mm -hmm. and they were educating me on the history of German culture and the importance of recognizing Germany's past. And, and what she said in particular, I forget the year, she said, you know, in Germany, we weren't even allowed to raise the flag in pride because mm -hmm. we wanted to ensure that we recognize our past and didn't yeah. repeat it. And, Hearing, you know, hearing a freshman talk about that and just, mm -hmm. she, I was, I was so impressed with her and so impressed that there was a, another young man there too. It was at a restaurant and there were our servers and, you know, we basically just sat and listened to them tell us about the history of Germany and the importance of recognizing our past to make the future better. And I think you hear that loud and clear from young people right now. And we just need to ensure that we are providing them the supports and the, the pathways in order to continue advancing that, that vision and that clarity. Um, so yeah, I'm really hopeful because of the next generation. What's your definition of success? I would say if you're helping other people, period. Mm. If you are improving lives, period. That's gotta, a beautiful I mean, answer. Yeah. That's pretty, it. As simple as that. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And do you think that has changed your definition of success? Or has it stayed pretty constant? I think that, I think it's been pretty constant. I remember when I was a senior in high school, I was writing for scholarships. Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate. There was this one opportunity um, with an insurance company that doesn't exist anymore that my mom um, had forwarded to me because at the time she worked for the local community Wells Fargo and it was, I think, their, their holding company or something at the time. But they asked the question, the very simple question, what does education mean mm -hmm. to you? And I had to write a one page answer and I, I recently saw it again and my closing said, I do not care if my name ends up in black and white as long mm. as the impact of what I do does. So I've always Whoa. been driven by helping others and, you know, 
finding some platform in which I can do so at large scale. So I don't think, I don't think it's changed much, but yeah. I, I've learned a lot along the way and I've done a lot of things. <laughs> I've made a lot of mistakes, tripped up a lot, but you know, that makes us who we are. Failure is important. Yeah. Well, Janelle, I want to take a moment to acknowledge you and your journey and your path from growing up in a small little place in Minnesota uh, and being so curious. Yeah. And being so curious and eager to get out and see the world and, you know, these opportunities that were presented to you to, you know, smell something that you've never smelled before and see things that you've never seen before. And now with what you're doing and finally having that seat at the table and, doing work that helps people, that impacts people, uh, and that continued hunger and drive that's within you to do that. Uh, that's incredible. So thank you for being here today. Well, thank you for opening it up and asking me these questions and all that you're doing, Linda. I can't wait to see where you go. And I mean, we're so fortunate to have you on the team. And I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that... One day we should get a chance to reverse your podcast and we want to ask all these questions <laughs> of you because the world has to hear your story and hear your ambitions because they're very impressive and I have no doubt that you're going to continue, continue to impress and make us all better. So thank you for, for creating the platform and all that you do. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest themes, you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at JAG Students. Thanks again and see you next time.